Alrighty, well, thanks everybody. And I'm here as representative of the, the RMPC. I've been on their advisory board for, for several years and it, it's, it's been a labor of love. And so just to, to baseline us, um, we have a goal for 2021 to 2030. And part of that goal is to advance the, um, uh, the number of nulls and phenotypes which, which we have now, it, as well as to make the data integrate with other data sets and not evolve away, but to have durable impact. So the slides I have, there's, there's no projector. And so with that, we had a slide here that Chris Austin showed about some ideas that we might consider for our next phase. And we all think about mice as uh, mammals and uh, humans as mammals too. So with that, I would like to thank the folks here that bring to us a, a human perspective and for us to uh, use this, this hour to talk about the commonalities of our shared goals of mammalian phenotyping, whether it's mouse or a human. So uh, with that, we'll, we'll start the panel. And uh, I had some slides which would uh, help to uh, baseline us. Uh, we'll wing it. And uh, we'll just, just use the microphones. So thanks. Well, I mean, so there are two things that I think about, that I've been thinking about over the last year. Uh, given the context that we're entering year three of the COM program, we have two and a half years to go. We have about a two-year typical planning process, unlike SCGE, miraculously came to life in one year. Um, we're not going to try and do that. We're going to take our time and, and plan things. So on one side, it's the scientific issues. On the other side, it's the political issues. It's aligning program goals with IC uh, interests um, and understanding funding mechanisms and mechanisms of doing diverse support for large programs, which is essentially, I'm saying, common fund. Um, so for, for, I think, for the NIH side, all of our thinking is colored by those practical issues. Um, probably from the science side, you can just think about the scientific issues. So maybe we should start there. Um, start with our success stories, which is a CMG collaboration and a null phenotype resource. It seems to be working really well. Are there things we need to do now immediately in the next two years to improve that resource, to make it more accessible to the clinic, to make it more relevant and more efficient? So we've heard the success stories. Would you like to say some, Would you like to scare us with um, the things that keep you up at night, that you worry about, that are problems, that um, you know we need better solutions for? Well, I must say that um, I think I, I found uh, this. I only was here for this one day, but um, I thought the science and the uh, opportunities that we heard about throughout the day were really uh, quite astounding. So I would think that we should all go home uh, one, enthusiastic, and two, invigorated from today's meeting. Um, Chris laid out several challenges at, at the beginning of his, at, at the beginning of the day. Uh, Chris and I were just talking at break and I was saying that I, I am, recently become much more enthusiastic about the prospects of developing therapies. And part of that enthusiasm stems from the big success of uh, CF, uh, but there are other examples as well. And, um, but a more, I suppose a more profound sense of op optimism comes from the, um, at least on the Mendelian diseases, frankly, from the progress in Mendelian disease identification. And that effort, I, did, I didn't make it clear in my talk, but the numbers, that 
I, I gave you the numbers for the CMGs, but obviously the communities, lots of people in the community doing the same activity. So overall, the number of new disease genes uh, has gone up dramatically. And so your chances of developing a biologically uh, rational cure are much better if you know what the molecular basis is to start with. And so we're making tremendous progress there. Um, the pathophysiology is always the more slower um, uh, activity, but um, the work of the mouse geneticists in terms of making models, which are not only helpful for disease gene identification, but also provide the resources that are necessary for studying pathophysiology and understanding the functional derangements that go along with uh, uh, defects in genes that we never heard about before. Uh, Nico mentioned a couple of them in his talk that are just eminently forgettable, except they're very important biologically. And so um, uh, just a lot of things that we wished we could have had as, uh, as little time as five years ago, we have now. The other thing I must say is um, we're hearing about some funded work from NIH. I get the sense that um, there for good creative projects, there's money available, and that we haven't been able to say that until just recently. So uh, we need all to make hay while the sun shines, I think. Um, and um, so I found that very, uh, all of that very positive. Uh, in terms of the collaboration, I, I must say, based on uh, the work between the CMGs and the uh, comp program, comp uh, PIs, uh, that I think uh, both groups are eager to collaborate. And uh, there's a sort of an energy of activation. I know Bob and I talked about collaborations for a couple of years before we actually got it rolling. But like many of these things, once you get it rolling, uh, it, it gathers momentum. And I think uh, both Steve and I feel like once we begin to see mice with phenotypes, the momentum will build quite rapidly. Um, and uh, that momentum will be generated not only by the CMG centers, but also by their submitters, the people that are, remember I said they're supposed to be the ones writing the papers, and, and they will love having uh, this data from the comp project, as well as, and I didn't make this opportunity, if you know you want the mouse model, there's an opportunity when the live mice are still on the counter, on the, available on the shelf, I guess you guys say, um, uh, uh, that there's an opportunity to get those again. That shortens the whole process and moves things along much more quickly. So, so question for you, Dave, and the rest of the panel is: When you want the the information or need the information, and I had a slide on that, but uh, to speaking mouse or speaking human, the the ontologies can be so so different at times in the accessibility of the flat files. The accessibility, are you going in by gene or phenotype, and what's the phenotype called? So what would be most helpful to you and to others in the human, in the clinical, in the patient-centric uh, facing fields? Because uh, we have our own jargon, right. and we would <laughs> like to make ourselves useful or data useful to, to your needs. Well. Uh, I'm, I'm not the most uh, facile informaticist in the room, that's for sure. Um, and, uh, but I take, um, uh, what I find is that the bedrock, at least for me, are the gene names. And uh, so one can go back, I find that one can go back and forth pretty easily the, that the way. The gene symbols, the, the universal gene, yeah, gene, gene symbol gene names. Symbols, yep. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think uh, the, um, uh, the databases for both species are also not too complicated. Uh, OMIM and related human uh, um, catalogs and then the mouse uh, databases are also quite, I think, easy to use. So I don't find that much of a problem. I do think that as uh, the CMG comp uh, collaboration moves forward, we're going to, as I said, we'll, we'll build better, uh, more transparent um, uh, informatic tools to help with that, that very problem that yep. you mentioned. When I say we'll build it, it won't be me, but somebody will build it. I mean, so we heard about the situation in the UK where they have the National Health Service. They seem to have ready access to the full medical record. We heard about the UDN where they bring the patient in, they do their own in-house phenotyping and genotyping. Um, 
Is there an issue trying to reach out to these X01, these more loosely connected collaborators? How do we make contact with the bench researchers to do follow-up stuff and make our resource available to them? It's, well, it I seems to me that's just, a challenge. You just contact them. They're, they're the, they know their phenotypes. Um, and, and for the CMGs, it's either there, there's, at every CMG, there's some uh, clinical yeah. experts, and then uh, at every CMG, there's some clinical experts that can talk to you at length about the phenotype, and they can refer you to the submitter who's actually sitting there in front of the patient um, and examining them. And I think um, yeah. uh, so others that can do that. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say it was a year ago that uh, K Dr. Kent Lloyd approached us and sent us an email saying we are comp to here. Uh, we are not UDN and we are not CMG either. So if you are uh, what I call grassroots clinical geneticist working in the clinic, you just heard a beautiful presentation by Dr. Rowan as to we are doing almost the same things and finding a lot of variants. We are unable to do gene discovery as such because you have to look for means to find collaborators. Mm -hmm. I feel like we were very fortunate. Kent Lloyd approached us and said, "Here's one, uh, we have this um, facility and availability of the COMP2 project. So the way we started off is, what are all our variants of unknown significance that we have found, and do we have any genes of unknown significance? Then we also came up with another, um, another I guess, category where the genes were already identified, but are they phenotypically going to add more, which we also heard in the last couple of days, which would be our gene of interest. So interestingly, for one of the patients, uh, the mouse model was already there, and the phenotype was slightly different where there was cardiomyopathy. So we were able to take that back to our patient and say, can you uh, go do an echocardiogram for this patient so we make sure that there is no cardiology issues going on for our patients. So, I think it was, it's a very good way of back and forth, and uh, gene name would be a great way of looking for mouse models. Can you give us a rough idea of what your demand would be for number of variants in a clinical year that you would be seeing and have that the level of questions around? Does it yeah. vary? Do you, have you found that it's pretty steady state? Um, but I would say that just over the past, uh, I guess, uh, six months, we find it like up to 30 variants from my clinic alone, and that's only like a small percentage. So we would be finding tons of variants, which brings us to the next question. How are we going to prioritize what exactly. genes we are going to be working on and what, um, which ones to choose? Because um, maybe I have like 20 genes that, you know, like they're willing to model. So are we going to look at the most common ones or the ones where we are going to find um, the max, uh, maximum po possibly, possibility of identifying it in your mouse phenotype or the ones mm -hmm. that are most severely affected or the ones that affects most individuals? So that's kind of a question I... Mm -hmm. so, uh, I so, uh, so in our six uh, part strategy for you know, decade for phase three and four, that there really covers a lot of the first half of it and beginning the dialogue now for what type of alleles is the black six background or are timelines compatible with your need for information to clinic would this be used as a diagnostic tool to help understand the treatment which would be a more immediate concern with the patient that's coming to see you or is this something that you have as an academic purpose that the timeline wouldn't be as critical because you know, for us to understand, to, to put ourselves in your shoes is, is really important today. So when you are, a, academically is very different than being a clinician in front of a patient yeah. because most clinicians would experience that. On the one hand, you feel the excitement of finding a diagnosis. On the other hand, when you're giving the diagnosis, the next question, the immediate next question is, so we have found the answer. What can you do for my child? What's the cure? Is there a cure? Or mm. what's the next step? For so a treatment. For a treatment. Yeah. And yeah, go ahead. Well, I just I wanted to touch on the variants of unknown significance first. So I, just for, in the human exome, we usually get about 20 to 25,000 variants, coding variants. 
And so the whole trick is to lay, to winnow down that number to get as close to one as you can simply by frequency, uh, known functional effects, model organism databases, essentially reaching out to every little bit of information you can find available. And doing that, uh, it often is possible to get, it depends on the mode of inheritance, but it's also po often possible to get down to a rather small number of reasonably strong candidates. Then a tool like uh, 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 Gene Matcher is very powerful because it's just you just put the gene name in there and then you just don't have to do anything until you get emails. And uh, finding other cases with similar phenotypes with rare variants in your favorite gene or one of your five top candidate genes sets you off in the right direction uh, right away and can help prioritize the variants. Mm -hmm. But these are very much research questions. They're not the um, in the clinic, I think it's fair to say that if you if you get a result in a known disease gene and um, your variant looks like it's functionally significant, then you begin to have some traction in terms of what you're going to be able to say to the parents, to the patients, even even if the variant has not itself been described before. Okay, so so that really could, could helps you just us. Sorry. Yep. so Karen had talked about that previously. Um, can you expand a little bit on that? I mean, it must be such a changing situation from years ago when you took your boards and there were three known genetic diseases and they were well described. And when you said something to the patient, you knew the prognosis, you knew the extent of the phenotype, you knew everything. Now you're overwhelmed with new diseases where that patient may be patient zero. What, what do you say to them in that situation? Because you, it must be difficult. We, we say exactly that. Um, that, you know, like it's so rare, we don't have much data on this, and um, there are probably, you know, like if it is a really known <laughs> disease causing gene, which is what we are dealing with right now, um, that there are only 30 other individuals, and then, you know, like I think most parents grasp the enormity of, oh, oh, my child is, has got such a rare disease. but. It depends on the situation. Some people are like feel the sense of relief to have known what to know what the child has, and there is a reason for it. And then the, there are others who immediately get on. So what can be done? What do you know about it? And where can we go? Uh, in that instance, we do look into like who is working on it, and so we may find a researcher who is very interested in that particular gene that we are looking at and um, look to see what's being done. So there, may, there could be a natural history study going on, so we'll send them for that. Um, there is one particular gene where uh, there is a brain ion accumulation. So uh, we look to the mouse models to see is there anything, you know, like in the mouse model. And if there is, and if there is brain accumulation, then there is ion chelators available, and some are. Um, Penetrant blood, you know, like they, they cross the blood brain barrier. So that's where we are beginning to look to prioritize as to is there something we can take back to the patients if we do develop a mouse model and if there are phenotypes that could, for which we could do either drug screening or some therapy where we could see tangible results, at least quantify something. I think that's how I'm beginning to look at things. And if I could just add one comment, when I was seeing patients in the clinical setting, I used to joke that if I was one internet search ahead of the families that were seeing me, <laughs> right. I would probably be okay in the clinic setting. But, you know, really, um, families are sometimes their own best advocates, and I feel that it, it really becomes a therapeutic alliance, so to speak, in terms of encouraging them to find other families and to be empowered by being able to connect with investigators. I think the internet and the the um, availability of these tools on the matchmaker exchange and some of those that have been described at this meeting, I think, is really quite remarkable. And you know, some some families will take their child's care sort of into their own hands and will reach out to uh, researchers and find ways to you know advance uh, a therapeutic development, which is um, quite remarkable. Yeah, I mean, we saw the UDN reported on in the New York Times recently as a medical mystery case, right, a couple of weeks ago purposely to attract the attention. I mean, I thought maybe they were disappointed with Matchmaker. That wasn't good enough. They had to go to the New York Times, but <laughs> I mean, uh, it was kind of an interesting storyline they there. had there, but 
Yeah, so we're kind of wondering, is there any, is there any outreach we should be doing into the patient advocacy community that would be useful? I think this, one thing that this makes the point of is um, that, uh, as we heard uh, earlier today, uh, geneticists currently do a lot of education. So when you send, let's say, a whole exome, a uh, clinical whole exome on a patient, you, if you want things to turn out as best as possible, you need to explain to the family what kinds of data you will get. You may find an answer that answers the problem right flat out, out of the bat, out of the box. Uh, you may find a lot of uh, data that you're not able, or you will find a lot of data that you're not able to explain perfectly and you'll be able to rule certain things out also. Um, and so I find at least that when you educate the patients before the test and then you come back with a result that you're not clear currently how to interpret, they, they say, okay, I, I got it, you said that might be a possibility and how can we move, move forward and understand that um, result more clearly uh, as we go, go along. Uh, so, um, but it does take a lot more, I would say, counseling of the patients and their families in the clinic both before the test and after the test comes back um, to, to uh, provide the best possible outcome. And I think the patients in general understand that the pace of research these days is moving along very quickly. And so a result that we're not able to interpret today, we may be able to interpret much better a month from now or two months from now or three months from now because uh, the pace of discovery is going so quickly that one of the first reports of the Baylor Clinical uh, Genetics Lab made the point that the solution, the diagnostic rate was about 25 percent, but of those cases that were, for which a diagnosis was made, the diagnosis involved a gene that was shown to be a disease gene sometime in the two years prior to the time the paper was published. So if you'd done that test two years earlier, you wouldn't have known what to make of that result at all. So the pace of discovery is really moving along uh, quickly. So one thing that uh, we've started to do or have been doing on, on the mouse side, and this is the COMP and IMPC, it's, it's Infra Frontiers in the EU, is is getting involved in the care for rare and the rare disease networks. And uh, I know n next year is the uh, campaign for European year for, for rare disease in, in 2019, and we're part of that. How can we leverage what we already have for enthusiasm for activities to reach the clinicians, to reach the clinical investigators, if you will, to what, what meetings, who are our customers and stakeholders here? Can you help us to, to understand that around the, the rare? And how can we better explain ourselves, position ourselves, and work for, for your benefit? Good. I was going to say, I think most clinicians, at least the geneticists, yeah. are well aware of uh, um, most phenotypes being available. Mm -hmm. They probably, uh, you know, like don't know how to reach out to somebody, maybe that's one of the things where, uh, you know, going to, uh, while well, having sessions at major meetings at ACMG, and um, the other group that we are kind of living out here are the genetic counselors, the NSGC, our genetic counselors do a lot of uh, counseling, and they're also very involved in um, figuring out things for our patients. So NSGC may be a good place to also uh, advertise on, you know, like there are these phenotypes available and the research facilities available. Yeah, come. yeah so I just wanted to, to sort of revisit this idea of outreach and, and ontologies and wondering, be, there are so many different human ontologies being out there and I know Damien and his team have been doing some really good work trying and the Monarch Consortium have been doing a really good job trying to, to, to cross-link these and, and to make our data more accessible to, to clinicians and you know as well to patients because what they hear is they hear the human terms that the, their clinicians and their genetic counselors use. I'm just wondering if there you can f see a role in how, 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 how willing do you think the general community beyond the consortia 
are to get involved in sort of actively helping us to um, sort of get our data out into the purview and, and make it more accessible to genetic counselors and patient groups and, and others who could potentially benefit because as you mentioned before, patients can be their own best advocates. So in a digestible way though, because I think often what, what we put up there is digestible for us, but not for someone who hasn't spent their life, their professional life doing this sort of thing. Um, you know, I think, I have no data on this. So it's just, it's just my opinion. Um, I think if you went around Johns Hopkins and you said, what are your thoughts about comp? Uh, just my random colleagues in the hall, uh, n most of them would have never heard of comp. They would know nothing about it. Um, so um, the genetics people do know about it, but um, uh, the rest of the clinical service, even in the Department of Pediatrics, doesn't know about it. But what they will know is when you publish papers. You, I, I think uh, going to meetings is great, talking at meetings is great, um, but uh, I think all, I, I hope all physicians are aware of um, PubMed and use it widely. Um, and, uh, and so I think you ha we, we were all admonished to publish and, and um, uh, it's, it's just really important to get the data out there. And the, uh, PubMed makes it really accessible no matter where you publish. So just getting it out there is important. And uh, kids first. So I was sent a lovely slide, which, which you can't see, but, but I can. And uh, <laughs> because I was asking at the break, who has helped to break the ice here and for speaking mouse and speaking human? and Kids First has done some uh, wonderful work to start that. Monarch has done some. I did a, a screenshot from some of the Monarch initiatives where they're breaking through to the anthologies. And if, if somebody from the panel, the audience, can speak to those efforts, because if they already have a headway, then we'd probably be best to, to, to follow that if those are accepted ontologies from the collective here. Uh, may I uh, offer an answer to the question about uh, data dissemination uh, on feeds into the ontology issue as well. Uh, Google launched an experiment three weeks ago called Google Dataset Search. Some of you may have heard about it, some of you are hearing from first time, but I believe in a few years uh, this will be the place where either your data is seen or resources or not. And this is actually linked to data technologies in action that will allow one to actually annotate one's resource, whether data, patient, etc., using metadata, ontologies, and such, so it can be searched in an intelligent way. Uh, this is kind of inverting what Google was really originally about, which is searching unstructured text, HTML. And the evolution actually was gradual until this point. Uh, in the sense that Google asked uh, webmasters to contribute more and more structured content using linked data technologies. But now with Google Data Search, they actually flipped it completely. They say, we will index whatever you tell us to index, but you give us metadata in this linked data format, and the searches will actually show, show, you, show your research. So anyway, this is my projection that this will be actually transformative. It gets the stuff where it's a publicly used resource. I mean, I, Terry talked about this. What the hit rate at PubMed is a thousand times higher than our hit rate at a million times higher. I mean, it's the holy grail. If you can get into PubMed, people will find it. So, hence you have to publish. Hi, I have a question slash comment that's for Melissa, but for the panel as a whole. And it seems to me, especially after hearing Melissa, that there are certain um, areas of human disease and disability that are really being underrepresented by the comp phenotyping pipeline, and in particular, how do we evaluate intellectual disabilities in mice who won't take IQ tests? And I'm, I'm just wondering, why not take a bunch of genes, and some of them must have already gone through the pipeline, why not take a bunch of genes that are known to cause intellectual disabilities in humans and then just ask what are the pleiotropic effects or what's the brain pathophysiology or what are the behavioral assays 
in the mouse that might actually reveal uh, a relationship to human intellectual disabilities. It, it may not be as hopeless as it appeared. I, I think that's and, a terrific idea. Yeah. And what Nora, yeah. what Nora oh, would counter with, I'm sure Nora would say do imaging, right? Yeah. yeah, no, I actually, I think that's a, a really very nice idea. And I, you know, none of us is, not, is naive in thinking that we're going to have a single IQ test that's going to be uh, useful for mice to help us understand their level of cognition. Most people would even argue for human beings that the standard IQ tests are flawed. So, you know, let's get out of this mindset of we're going to have one test. I think what we have to look at is functional domains. And I think the folks at NIMH have a very interesting um, approach to this. Are you all familiar with RDoC? Is anyone? I know that NIMH is probably not as well represented here at this meeting, but they're really trying to take these really complex behavioral phenotypes, such as you know anxiety and depression, and really break them down into their components, and not relying so much on the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Health Conditions, the DSM-5, which has been sort of the standard for diagnosis of mental health conditions. But essentially what I'm suggesting is that there may be some sort of parsable entities that are domains of, say, executive function that you could find something comparable in the mouse, or attention that you could find comparable in the mouse, that might actually map on some of these complex human cognitive and behavioral phenotypes, and could actually give you some traction in trying to sort out uh, which genes and which phenotypes are linked to those genes, and, and really start to make some progress in the intellectual disability uh, field. To, to use the genetics to help understand the phenotype in this case, right. to, to do it by, by the human approach. Yeah. I guess, um, so I'm, 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 I'm new to this uh, discussion, so, uh, but for me, it sounds like the question is, what is the question? So. I think that I, I understand the utility of, oh, I found a patient in somewhere in the world. Can somebody please make a mouse so I can diagnose them? But from my perspective, I, I'm sorry to be, I mean, you know, I, I use multiple organisms. The mouse is not the correct route because it will never scale, ever. Every exome will, will derive a minimal of after uh, day's point, from very high quality bioinformatic analysis, we're going to still end up with two to five candidate genes, and that number will stay plateaued for a very, very long time, especially for the de novos that will keep popping up. So I, what I'm thinking, though, is that there is amazing opportunities um, to actually prioritize sets of alleles that will be useful to the community, not necessarily for diagnosis, but for biology. So you will never compete with the zebrafish model where it costs 1500 bucks to test an allele. Uh, you know, it's just never going to happen. But the zebrafish model sucks at consistency. It sucks at um, uh, looking at progressive disease states. It sucks at generating enough biological material to do transcriptomics, to do metabolomics, to, uh, to do other interesting things. And I, I'm speaking of the zebrafish because this is what I know, but I think the same. The, my, my fly colleagues and my worm colleagues will say the same thing. So I think it's not, you know, I think it will be, I mean, you know, the, 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 the knockout project was amazing because it answered also biological questions and, you know, questions of tolerance and, and genome plasticity. It, it might be useful to think about in terms of what is the next really big question impact is going to be, right? So I, I heard earlier on today about the variable effect of nonsense mutations on transcriptional regulation, splicing, this and that. This is a fantastically important question that we're going to have a very hard time asking in, in humans, not least because we don't even know whether a nonsense allele in a fibroblast, which is all we're going to get from a, from a human or maybe blood, will have the same misplicing effect in the nervous system, which is what we really want to know. Well, I think this group is, is, is supremely positioned to answer this question. I also think that uh, so there was mention about laminin, right, and, and, the, and the spectacular, you know, disease on this. Well, these are some of the alleles that might well be made because there's a very deep biology that could be gleaned from that and so on and so forth. The last thing to say is, again, to, to sort of proselytize you to sort of my view of the world a little bit, is that there's two other questions that I think COMP should consider answering, then I'll shut up, I promise. Um, the first one is the species-specific activity. This we've got to face. Um, it's a major bias, both positive and negative, depending what our starting point is. 
And again, I think you have the setup and the tools to actually answer this question in an absolutely comprehensive fashion. Um, we should be making some of the cis symbol double mutants and asking the question. The second thing is, is a little footnote that somebody said early on. Remember, 7% of, of children, of individuals, uh, who undergo clinical exome sequencing at the moment, are twofers. But we do not understand truly whether these are two independent events or whether additive or they were multiplicative. I think these are areas of, of I'm going to call it clinical biology, that we really need to understand. So th these perhaps are some of the big questions that you might want to consider anchoring your next activity as opposed to more in which alleles, and I'll, and I'll stop. Yeah, I mean, we're sort of talking about finishing because we're halfway through the null allele on a single background, and it's very doable, and the end point is in sight. And then uh, the opportunity, once we, uh, since we have this platform, to pursue other angles, but I think you're right. We, we're going to take a clean slate look at things we're going to look at alleles, variants, complex genetic interactions. We have to consider all the model systems, all the experimental systems, when we look at that. But I think Comp Comp or, you know, Mega Mosque is what I'm thinking. But Could I ask know. a Nico question? Yeah. Just, uh, Nico, uh, many missense mutations, in fact, I would say that the vast majority of missense mutations actually have their negative effect, if they are deleterious, have their negative effect by disrupting protein folding. And so the zebrafish, of course, lives at a different temperature than mammals. Uh, so are alleles that disrupt protein folding in mammals, uh, do they also disrupt protein folding and to a similar extent when introduced into the zebrafish? The only answer I can give you in that context is that when we look at specificity data, as in we take missense alleles that we know are detrimental to function in humans and we test in the fish, we see the same level of deleteriousness. So I guess I'm not asking the question fully, but all I can tell you is that if, they, the, if they're acting as deleterious in a human because they're folding, they're still acting as deleterious in, in that system, but I do not know whether it's because of folding or not. But the false positive rate is essentially zero. So a question for, for the clinical folks here and then uh, uh, but, but for the human phenotyping, where are you seeing the best place for that data to go so then we could be a fast follower, if you will, with, with the mouse data? And, and instead of us looking for our own database to, for, for you to go to, where do, do you think the collective knowledge should reside? Is there one that, that you use now? Is it Omen? Is it something else? I mean, where should we be uh, looking? Yeah. All right. So uh, I think uh, I have a one kind of uh, very general uh, question, which is, you know, phenotyping is the bottleneck in terms of imbalance, right? Genotype, phenotype. With whole genome sequencing, we have much less phenotypic information. Second is we have problem matching in you know, our model phenotype with human phenotype. Uh, shouldn't this bottleneck be addressed by now turning to molecular phenotypes as possible solution? And let me, uh, well, the, uh, of course, you guess my answer, right? My answer is yes, and uh, I'll suggest two. You know, one is epigenome, which may give us a clue about effects of regulatory variants in terms of inducing allelic imbalances in the same way in the model and human, which is a kind of ideal control experiment where we have locus in a heterozygous state within the same nuclear environment, right, within the same cell, and we can observe whether we can recapitulate, say, effects of variants on changing local methylation in cis as a signature of uh, transcription factor binding effects and such. The other molecular phenotype may be met metabolome, right, because it's the first one that has entered clinic. It's now in wide use by major projects. So if we could match uh, metabolic perturbations, uh, multi-metabolic perturbations in humans to those in mice, we can actually maybe arrive at a conclusion that some of the phenotypes that are not recapitulated sufficiently at the whole organism level may in fact be recapitulated at the molecular phenotype level, and in that way validate our models and gain insights also in the mechanisms, you know, the uh, mole molecules that mediate the effect on the ultimate phenotype. This, this is very important also for complex diseases that are quite heterogeneous at the organismal phenotype level, 
and may allow us also as a side effect to dissect these more complex phenotypes. Yeah, yeah I mean, I think if, if we had the money and technical support to be able to do RNA-seq on our knockouts, it would be fabulous. I mean, direct links to, to the links program, to, it's just a fungible digital Bitcoin can take you a lot of different places. I, I think cost is an issue, but there are now assays, say, metabolome and so on, and uh, maybe targeted epigenomics, which actually are becoming quite affordable. Actually, one can argue cheaper than complex phenotyping of humans. So that, um, um, the, um, first of all, let me say that I, I, I love the idea about uh, using uh, the me metabolomics profile as a a broad and sort of one-stop biochemical um, data for each patient. There are published data showing that um, the closer you get to the gene, the more penetrant variants are and the more uh, easier it is to see the genetic effects. Uh, so that would be uh, all to the good. There's a lot of biochemical data already out there, but it's not organized into one single test. So you have to pull it together from all different places, and, and that takes time and money and so forth. The th thing about phenotyping is that it's very, um, it, it's, a, it's important in my view, this is just a personal bias, to do it in a uniform way, in a way that's searchable and recallable. And that way is not the medical chart as the medical chart currently exists. If there was a, an, um, if there was a program that would go to, let's say, EPIC and pull out the data in an organized, EPIC is the electronic patient record at most of the, the it's currently the number one, one in the country. It's completely opaque to many users. Um, but if, if there was some way to go in and interrogate what's in the EPIC chart and put it into a very straightforward accounting of the phenotypic features, that would be extremely useful. We, in PhenoDB, we record the phenotypic information in a very standardized way. It's very quick to score. It means that we score every patient using the same queer set of data queries, and it's very, uh, it's a very uh, robust way of evaluating the phenotype, or, or re not evaluating, but of, of scoring all the phenotypic data. Uh, but we don't have, we have not built a tool that would, let's say, go to EPIC and extract those data out of EPIC. Those, those data are coded, though, right, as opposed to yep. a DB term? Uh, Let me just clarify. I was not actually referring to phenotypic or EHR data. I was referring to actually measurements that can be done comprehensively on hundreds of metabolites and so on. That may be a complement to what you're saying, yeah. but it's actually a different yeah. approach. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and pulling data out of EPIC is probably illegal anyway. <laughs> no, you, no you, you could do it in a way that was, uh, you could do it. It was, it was okay. Right. So, the, the, the only so comment I have to say about the um, right. molecular right. genotyping right. is finding a gene um, or when you do a molecular analysis is going to be effective only if your phenotyping is good because of the unknowns in the genome. Still. Let me just add uh, one additional advantage of molecular phenotyping is that, in fact, phenotypic information can be exchanged freely without danger of de identification, right? So you can publish all the phenotypes and have a matchmaker, right, mm -hmm. on molecular phenotypes without any concerns because metabolomic profile is not identifiable. Now, uh, biochemical uh, perturbations, you know, biochemical testing lab will tell you that, you know, they can read these metabolomic perturbations and find all kinds of things about nutrition, disease, and so on. So I, I think that it depends yeah. maybe on the domain. If you're too far away from biochemistry, then maybe this may be a not familiar territory, I think. I, I know that Baylor is probably moving fa fastest with uh, metabolomics. Yeah. And I see Art uh, behind you there. Art, are you using artificial intelligence to it? Uh, to score the uh, meta metabolomic profile? That seems to me to be a perfect opportunity. Uh, not to my knowledge. Uh, uh, well, I should disclose, I do have a research project with Baylor Genetics where we're doing exactly that, you know, uh, detecting perturbations at multi-metabolite levels, so. <laughs> if, if I can make it. So it's, it's five o'clock and some people have to catch planes, so if you need to leave, feel free to. 
I, I just had a quick comment about the use of electronic medical records. And one of the mechanisms that has allowed Stephen Kingsmore to have these 56-hour turnaround times in some cases for his rapid whole genome sequencing of uh, ill newborns in the NICU has been an approach that uses natural language processing and AI approaches artificial intelligence to extract meaningful data from the medical record. It's not just looking at HPO terminology, but it's actually a fairly complex algorithm, which I know I couldn't begin to explain to you, but has shown to have some remarkable efficacy for actually being able to home in on what are the relevant genetic variants that might uh, explain this newborn's uh, medical problems and phenotype. So I think there is some emerging work in this field, and I, I'm sure there are others who are doing similar so sorts of approaches, because the, the EMR systems are, as you say, opaque, heterogeneous, and bulky to work with. So we have some other strategies that we ha think we have to use. So I have a question just on common fund uh, synergy. Is there an effort to combine the data sets from the different common fund, you know, just as thinking just common fund efforts? Because one advantage of that is for all the money invested by common fund over these years, at least it's protecting and integrating those combined efforts. There are a lot related, there's rare, there's personalized, there's IMPC comp. Is there a common fund ideal on how to preserve and uh, retain for durable impact these collective efforts? Well, do we have anybody from Data Commons? I, I don't, you mean here today? No, I don't think so. We might have a PI. Anybody involved in the Data Commons? We. We do have an effort within the Common Fund called the Data Commons, and it has a new name now, which I'm not even going to remember. <laughs> but it is to basically provide a place for not only the Common Fund data sets, but other data sets and um, allow integratable searches across them and, uh, and also for them to be used on the cloud. And my understanding is that the, the first three sort of pilot data sets are um, the model organism databases, top med from NHLBI, GTEXO, thank you, um, which actually used to be one of my programs. So, And also Kids First is sort of um, latching onto that, and my understanding is UDN is a little bit further down in the pipeline. So we're, we're trying, and also the microbiome project is is, is, you know, is poised to go in. So it's something we've been trying to address for a number of years, and I think now we're just, just actually starting to make progress in doing it. Because we've made a recommendation, at least the advisory board did, that the IMPC comp effort have a dedicated working group to looking towards that to meet your needs while we're still in phase two. Mm -hmm. And because we want this effort whether we are at, at 8,000, 20,000 genes and phenotype data sets to be able to integrate and have impact for all the common fund efforts for, for 20 years. Right, and I guess one way that I'm thinking about it is if you're, if you're already working with Kids First and UDN and um, some of the other programs, you know, you can all sort of go together or at least have some, some things and some strategies in common. But the other thing to say is that our office is hiring somebody to a person, a full-time person, to actually work at reaching out to the programs that aren't in the in the first three data sets. So again, it's something we haven't hired that person yet, but it it should be happening within the next few months. While we're on this topic, uh, I think everybody in the room recognizes that I Exac and Nomad have been a tremendous resource for interpreting. Uh, genetic data, uh, and we need a similar resource for whole genome data. We have really quite puny whole genome data. We heard today, I think, 125,000 genomes in TopMed. Are those accessible in an exact like NOMAD-like um, database? Sorry, thank you. Uh, thank you for reminding me to use the mic. Um, the uh, uh, data itself is available through dbGaP for 55,000 of those. The rest are uh, accessible within the program and the um, uh, Informatics Research Center 
has uh, done joint calling, but I don't know uh, just how much of an answer I can give you today as to um, uh, well, Shirley, I how grant. I was going to say, don't they, I mean, Gonzalo Abacasis' group is creating a Bravo server, and right. the Bravo server really is equivalent to Nomad in terms of being a variant level server for that whole genome data. So in addition to the, the things you were just describing, that is one of the efforts that's coming out of TopMed. And, and do we have a timeline on it? So Bravo is currently um, publicly available now. Um, you can just search Bravo Top Med. Um, you just need a Gmail login. You can log in and, and search variants. Um, there's a lot of really great data in there. Um, can't not, not really recalling off, off the top of my head, but I would encourage you to explore that. Um, we're also, um, uh, it's turned out to be a little more complicated than we would like, but um, there is also an imputation server with all of the Top Med data. Um, there are a lot of um, policy issues with sharing that publicly, but um, we're also working to hopefully get that made publicly available um, within the next year or so. And I'll also mention that um, the Data Commons has a portion of it dedicated to Top Med uh, that we actually call Data Stage. Um, and that is meant to um, provide both um, cloud resources and storage, but also tools and analytics um, publicly on the cloud um, and in a way that would um, make this sort of thing more available to researchers that don't have the really heavy infrastructure that you would need um, to do some of this really uh, high throughput whole genome analysis. Thank so you. It's coming. Yeah, uh, so concerning the the data integration for, at least in Europe, for the IMPC data, there are uh, two possibilities that I'm aware of. So one of them is to, uh, to have uh, the IMPC database as one of the core data resources for the bioinformatic research infrastructure called Elixir. Right, and uh, the other one which I'm aware of is that uh, there is a project called the European Open Science Cloud, LIFE, which is a collaboration of uh, different uh, research infrastructures in life sciences. And it would be possible to nominate uh, uh, IMPC into incorporating into this project to have, uh, yeah, to preserve the data there. Or, yeah. can, can you send an email on, uh, on that? Because I'm not sure I, caught, I, I got the notes, but what we could do is uh, take that on. Sure, no problem. Well, the study group on database integration or data integration. Yeah, I can do that, yeah. Well, I'm, yep. I think we've had a full day. So, so one last question or going back on, mm -hmm. uh, on data set. So as a clinician, when you try to find data, do you go to OMEN or what's your gold standard? Because if we want to take a look at the ontologies and how that's being staged, then that would help us go to where you like to go. Uh, I think any practicing clinical geneticist has a computer open to OMIM in the clinic constantly. Okay. They, can't, they cannot really do their work very well without that. Also, any practicing clinical geneticist uh, is reasonably facile with Exact and Nomad exactly. um, because they, they get a report on the sequence from somebody. Uh, there'll be some, you know, they go through the first, they don't look at the first three pages, they go to the bottom line <laughs> and there's some variants listed there and they want to know how frequent those variants are and they know they can get those data from Nomad or Exact, you know, immediately. Okay. And, um, and they, for the most part, the residents, the fellows, the clinicians know how to use those databases without any problem. So for common fund data sets, if we looked at those and tried to bring our mountain to, to that mountain, for a five-year plan, at least we're combining some of the key, the key foundations. So if, if we consolidate on one side in the translational model end, and there's consolidation on the human end, then that may be a smarter way to go than all the bits and pieces trying to uh, be, be, be formed in separate uh, spheres. Right, and the, the other site that's open is PubMed in the clinic all the time. And you, because in a, gene, a typical genetics clinic, you never know what's gonna walk in the door. And you, a practicing geneticist is someone who uh, 
is comfortable taking on a patient that they have never seen a patient with that problem before in their life. And so in the f minute or two before they go in to see the patient or the day before when they learn that that's what's coming, they're doing a quick study uh, uh, to see what's known about that okay. disorder. So that's where they go on their deep dive and then just specifically for OMEN on, on some of the known phenotypes or associations? Yeah. 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 Okay. And, and the, I mean, uh, the other thing is uh, uh, gene report. What is that? Our gene. Uh, Gene reviews, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, excuse me if I can just interrupt. I didn't hear you say anything about that the clini clinician uses ClinGen. Is that a useful resource? Uh, they do. They do. I, I'm dating myself a little bit okay. here. Okay. Yeah, because that's, that's, that's another yeah. um, potential interaction to work with that con consortium, find out what functional data they need to complete a review. Right, yeah. I, I only see follow-ups now, so I All right. So you know, what I'm hearing is kind of recommendations about how, how to build these systems and so on. I would like that, you know, the recommendations be uh, what the clinicians are experienced with is interfaces, right, web interfaces. They're enormously important, actually. But we have a different layer of design is underneath it using APIs, linked data technologies, and such. So whenever recommendations are made, they should take into account both the technical perspective and user perspective. Unle if we go off balance, we'll be building silos. We'll be using approaches that are 50 years old since the era of you know, airline reservation systems. But times are changing rapidly uh, on the web. And so we should be thinking about how to employ the latest technologies so that layer underneath it, right? actually scales to the diversity and volume of data and accommodates a multiplicity of contributors, right, who contribute their own pieces of the puzzle. And I think uh, fairness, you know, uh, FAIR is a new set of principles that's been uh, promulgated by the NIH. It's been enormously useful, actually, as a way of bringing up the technical aspect of uh, the actual implementation of systems. So fairness actually talks about that layer underneath the user interface and says um, you not only need to build a silo, you need to build an interoperable system, which means it needs to talk to other systems, to computer programs, who can have their own interfaces, so-called APIs, so you can share your data through that. And findability actually is the key one, which means you need to use certain identifiers, you need to have metadata about identifiers, and expose it for search by search engines, like such as, uh, you know, BioCaddy data med index built in NIH, for example, a fair share. But now things are really changing with Google data search. Why? Because Google data search, if you follow these principles uh, in the past few years, you're ready for Google data search. Why? Because they're asking for the same thing. And all of a sudden, this ecosystem is growing. So what I'm saying is we should be careful about the actual implementation, right? And take into account these trends and so build interoperable systems that interoperate not only with each other and within the small biomedical research world. And I'm saying by small because I'm having data search in mind where there's all kinds of additional information there, but also interoperable with these broader trends which actually will dictate technologies uh, going forward. Yeah, I mean, th the IMPC data is on OMIM but it's buried in a sidebar in a pull-down menu where you get a link out, and that's not effective. I mean, what should be there is a synopsis of our, our, our findings, right? Boom, right in front of you. <laughs> so. And uh, speaking of that, you know, this uh, design principle makes it possible for multiple parties to build user interfaces on top of the same underlying infrastructure. So the benefit to the end user is that there could be multiple interfaces catering to different audiences, right? So that their needs are maximally met and uh, there isn't a single portal or single interface because it's very hard to meet the needs of all users, right, of OMIM and so on. So this design will actually, in, in the end, benefit uh, all the audiences as well. Yeah. Yeah, I, I have minimal influence on OMIM, but some, and I will do my best. <laughs> Okay, on that note, Dave's going to solve all our problems for us. We're good. We can leave. We, we have a volunteer. We have a volunteer. Yeah. So I don't want to take up any more of your time. We're, we're over time. 
I think we've had a very full day. We've got a lot of work we're ready to do this coming year. Supplements are in place. Plans are in place. Excitement is in place. Um, we'll meet again here next year and hear about a lot of progress that's been accomplished. So thanks for your time. <laughs>